Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the latest edition of the Jake's Take with Jacob Ayeshar podcast. I'm your host, Jacob Ayeshar, the chief content producer and writer of jakesteak.com, a pop culture entertainment news website. Before we get started, if you're listening to this on our podcast platforms, please give us a five-star rating and also please subscribe. My next guest has over 20 years at CBS. He was in charge of the marketing campaigns for some of the begin- biggest shows of all time, such as Survivor, Big Brother, and the Amazing Race. Now he's an author and has the latest book out. It's called The Unexpected Danny Green. So please help me welcome my next guest, Paul R. Freeman. <laughs> what an introduction. Thank you, Jacob. I appreciate that. You're so welcome, Paul. Thank you so much for taking time out of your schedule to talk with me today. I really appreciate it. My pleasure. My pleasure. All right. So, Paul, when did you first get interested in the entertainment industry and how did that passion evolve and desire to pursue a career in it? Well, I got interested in the entertainment business, much like I'm sure lots of young kids watching TV, going to the movies, acting out, acting out a lot. And uh, so my mother said, uh, let's channel this energy and uh, put me in a couple of plays when I was younger. And uh, when I was in college, even though I was studying political science, I caught the acting bug. I caught it very seriously and uh, had an opportunity to read a lot of the great plays, work on scenes from them. Arthur Miller, Tennessee Williams, uh, Neil Simon. And as a result, I started also to develop an ability to write. And as you know, with many actors, uh, when you're not successful in one area, you kind of turn your energy elsewhere. So that's what I did. And um, I, I, I got myself, I sandwiched myself, I shoehorned myself into the entertainment business. That's amazing. That is very amazing to hear. And that's what, in my, what, that's what I did as well. But like with me, I wasn't an actor. I was a jerk. I always, well, even though I acted from, from the end of elementary school to high school, I was a, I, it was broadcast journalism and watching great shows like 60 Minutes that was definitely played a big role in my career. Yeah, well, I, I, what I was able to do once I got underway, uh, I was working in Los Angeles. I got a job as a page. I started at the very bottom and that's a story in and of itself. And then I made a great, great lateral move. I moved to the mailroom. Boy, I thought now I'm in the, in the building and people will take notice. And actually, very, very few people took notice, except that I was kind of irritating them by constantly coming into their offices and and trying to pitch myself. But uh, after I got some work going in Los Angeles, uh, the guy I was working for, unfortunately, was fired. So I picked up and I moved to New York. I always wanted to live in New York and uh, moved myself to New York. And I was very fortunate to get a job again at CBS in New York, eventually in the news division. So when you talk about 60 Minutes, it's something that uh, is something very close and very dear to my heart because I got a chance to work on the CBS Evening News. That's amazing. That's that's some pretty, pretty amazing stuff. Like to be at CB in CBS when Dan Rather and all those incredible journalists that were there doing 60 Minutes and like editing, it must have been an incredible atmosphere. That atmosphere must have been electric. It was absolutely electric. Uh, I was responsible for writing what they call a news tease that Dan Rather read, and every day it went out to local stations. We recorded it. So I had to brief myself every day on what the local news, not local news, but what the international news uh, stories were and figure out what was going to be on the broadcast that night. Of course, I got guidance from the executive producers of the show. So I would present copy. I would sit and, and in, in the newsroom with uh, my 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 news briefs from Reuters, uh, United Press International, the Associated Press, and any information I could glean from correspondents in the field. I would prepare a script and I would present it to Mr. Rather. I remember the very first thing he ever said to me, it's very funny, he said, there's no pride in authorship here. And I was kind of curious, hmm. I think what he was saying is, if I wanna edit your material, if I wanna edit your script, let me do that. And I was like, that was going to be no problem at all, because I know that he was better versed with the stories of the day than I was. So no pride in authorship. And that kind of carried with me. Be collaborative. That's, that's incredible. I can't believe you got that advice from Mr. Rather. That's amazing. So 
when did you move over from news to marketing? Because one of your greatest accomplishments from CB from your time at CBS was marketing three of the biggest reality TV franchises, Survivor, Big Brother, and Amazing Race when they were at their infancy. So what were some of the strategies that you used to promote those shows? Well, here's the thing. It started with Survivor. Survivor premiered in the summer of 2000, uh, 2020. <laughs> uh, 2000, what am I saying? The summer of 2000. So that's 20 odd years ago. Uh, the guy I was working for comes to my office and he said, hey, what do you think about a show where we're going to take some people, we're going to abandon them on a tropical island. We're not going to give them any food. We're not going to give them any shelter. We're just going to let, let them see and have them build civilization and see what happens. And we're like, this is an incredible idea. We've all read Treasure Island when we were kids. We've all seen the New Yorker cartoon where two guys are on a deserted island with one palm tree and they're saying, what are we going to do next? So Survivor premiered in the summer, early summer of 2000. It was a Wednesday night and it was very successful. But within 13 weeks, we grew the audience every week, 3 million, 5 million, 5 more million, 5 more million. And at the end of the 13 weeks, on the, the finale of the first Survivor, we had 55 million viewers tuning in live. It, it was astonishing, astonishing. So you ask me, how did we promote that type of show? Well, first, we wanted to initiate what it was all about. We wanted to get the concept of what it was because it was foreign to people. They had no idea what Survivor was. Then, of course, we realized that the relationship between the castaways was something that was really getting people's attention. So we started to focus on that. The word alliances came up. That had never really been used before. What's an alliance? Who's forming an alliance? Who's, who's, who's being uh, uh, ostracized? Who's, who's going to be voted out? So the drama was obviously inherent in the relationship between the people, and we exploited that. One of the things we did, and I'll never forget this, uh, it was a Wednesday night when it was on the air in the summer of 2000. Wrote a promo, and it said, if you're not watching Survivor on Wednesday, what will you talk about Thursday? Okay, so now this is part of the zeitgeist. Finally, actually wrote a line that said, if you're not watching Survivor, you don't have a TV. What kind, of market, <laughs> what kind of marketing idea is that? If you don't have a TV, you're not getting this message. So we were having a lot of fun with the audience's expectations. And, and the, final, the final episode, we said, want to see, what was it? Want to see a scene from the Survivor finale? And we said, so do we. So it was like, even the network didn't know what the hell was going on. It was so incredible. So those were some of the things that we did to play with the audience's expectations and play with our own sense of having a phenomenon on our hands. It was not just Survivor, but you also turned your attention to Big Brother and the Amazing Race. So what were some of the similarities and differences between marketing those two, show those two shows along with Survivor? Well, the Amazing Race came along and that also was interesting because again, we go back to the teams, we go back to the people, we go back to rooting interest for our audience. Who, who are you gonna key on? Who do you like? Who do you dislike? Who's playing by the rules? Who's bending the rules? Plus you had the aspect of international travel. So, I mean, from the confines of your home, you were able to go around the world and travel with these people and, and, and suffer with them when they weren't successful and be, be, be happy and celebrative when they, with them when they were. So that was, that was a, a kind of survivor, but it also had the international travel appeal. Awesome. So countless com people have competed on all these shows and have built a career in influencing marketing, news, podcasting, the world of television and wrestling worlds. So what does it mean to you that you played a small role in watching other people's careers in the industry? You mean watching other people succeed and achieve? Uh -huh. and, and there I was anonymously working. Um, you know, it's fascinating because I, I realized early on that I, I lived in, a, in, in two worlds. The micro world in an edit room of trying to create something, trying to work on cutting something specifically, working with my team. And then taking what we finished, what took us hours maybe to construct, and then putting it out on the air in a, in a macro world into 100 million viewers' homes. So it was, 
what's really satisfying and what's always been gratifying for me is the creative pursuit. So as long as I was able to come up with ideas and be creative and work with an incredible team of writer, producers, of, of editors and, 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 and designers, I felt like an incredible sense of fulfillment, even though I was operating in obscurity. That's amazing that you've done that behind the scenes. And I love seeing all that because not only were you part of these guys, but you also played roles in with the Kennedy Center Honors and the Grammys as well. So these are some prestigious events in the performing arts world. Well, the Grammys is, is such a unique, unique program. One of the things about award programs, as we know, is oftentimes you give an award, someone gets up, they accept the award, they give a speech. Sometimes it's long-winded, sometimes it's boring, and then they get another award, somebody else comes up. The Grammys is unique and always has been in that there are, within the three-hour time period, there's about 16, 17 completely live Pro, uh, uh, live, uh, uh, what is it, uh, performances. Mm -hmm. and, the, and the thing about the Grammys that they did, they discovered early on, is if you pair two stars in a unique performance, it's something that you're never going to see again. You've never seen it before. You're never going to see it again. Elton John with Eminem. Prince with Beyonce. Paul McCartney with Bruce Springsteen. I mean, so that, for the marketing folks, was like handing us gold because we could promise people that they were going to see something that was going to happen once, and then it was never going to happen again. Absolutely. Those performances are Grammy moments, and I'm also thinking of other Grammy moments, such as Santana and Rob Thomas singing Smooth, another Elton yes. John do performance that you did with Elton John with, his Backstreet, with the Backstreet Boys and Lady Gaga, another Beyonce one with Tina Turner, and then not to mention another one that really moved me was Joss Stone and Melissa Etheridge just days after Melissa Etheridge was battling cancer. Yeah, you're absolutely right. See how memorable those things are? And when you tell people about them, they go, oh my God, that happened on the Grammys? Yes, it did. Awards are given out, people give speeches, but they still really want to focus and emphasize that this is a show celebrating music, celebrating the artists, and celebrating the fans who love the music. Absolutely. Let's turn our way from television and into the book world. So you've released The Unexpected Danny Green. Could you describe this novel to my audience? Danny is a physically gifted, intellectually curious young man. He's from the South. He was born on the wrong side of the tracks, but he was born to the right family, fortunately. His mother is a grade school teacher. His father is, uh, runs a lawnmower repair shop out of the family garage. His father has tremendous intellectual curiosity and he goes to the library, he checks out books, historical novels, novels about, about uh, famous men and women, autobiographies. So right away when he's a young, young kid, intellectual pursuits are encouraged in the home. His first sense of competition comes from his older brother. They share a bedroom together and anyone who's had a brother or a an older sibling knows that there's competition between the two. So Danny has this sense of, I'm physically capable, but I also like smart things. Um, one day uh, he's in high school, he walks by and hears the sound of leather hitting other leather, and it draws him into this warehouse where there's this very rudimentary boxing gym. It's not the kind of gym that we're familiar with today with, with chrome, weights and, and all the fab fabulous equipment. It's really a, about the basics, the basics mano a mano, two men facing each other in the ring. And uh, shortly he realizes that he enjoys the training. He enjoys wrapping his hands, putting the gloves on, and he discovers he has a lethal left hook. So this, this is something that is kind of a phenomenon. Danny, I believe I'd like to say is a, is a, American folk hero. He's someone, a, a, a hero for our time. He has integrity, he, he's humble, uh, and uh, he's also extremely capable. That's incredible. And along the way, he transitions from this powerhouse boxer to box office star. So what was that, was that transition similar to anyone in real, in real life? Because well, that sounds been, like... 
Yeah, excuse me. There have been a number of fighters who have actually gone on to careers in, in the media, who've gone on to become writers, who've gone on to also careers in, in film. Uh, this, is, this is not anything that Danny plans. Um, the reason why I call it the unexpected Danny Green, his brother is older than him. He's born before Danny, of course. When the mother gives birth, she has a very difficult pregnancy and the doctor tells her she cannot have any more children. So when Danny comes along, they are so thrilled at the miracle of his birth. So he's unexpected. That translates into many, many aspects of his life as he moves forward. Things occur that are completely unexpected to him. And he can't really anticipate what the next step is going to be. And hopefully readers won't be able to anticipate what the next move is. So in that regard, hopefully it's a page turner for them. That's amazing. Also, one of the things I was reading about was that he has, he goes to two different Howards at this point, Howard Costello, one of the masters of sports media, and Howard Stern. So what were some of his interactions similar and different between both men in the book? I wanted, I, I thought it would be interesting to use some historical people in the book just to show that his life was, was real, even though this is a novel, so it's fiction. But as, as he goes through, it made sense that he was going to somehow be interviewed by Howard Cosell, who at the time in the 70s and the 80s was the premier sports broadcaster. We know that. And he's also, he was very provocative. He was all very intelligent and very insightful. So the fact that Danny went up against him or was interviewed by him became something I thought would be fun to play with. Conversely, I don't want to get too far ahead in the story, but uh, he has an opportunity in a very, very humorous way to, be, to appear on the Howard Stern show. And um, that, that, as you know from, from reading it, is, um, is something that, that doesn't go exactly as expected and as planned. But it's a very, very funny moment, I believe, in the book. Awesome. So I, we, well, before we get, we get too far up in the writing process, I love to talk about the writing process because the writing process for this book would be different for any other writing process for any other book. So what was your writing process like and how long did it take you to create the, to write the Unspect Danny Green from first draft, from inception to release? Well, writing the book in itself took, I would say a, a good year. Going through the editing process, the rewriting process took time as well. Then the design work with a beautiful, fantastic artist to design the cover and um, formulate how I wanted the book to be packaged. And then of course, having it printed, getting it up on Amazon where it currently is. And, and for your listeners, you can find it at amazon.com. It's the unexpected Danny Green. But, but what I wanna talk about the, the writing process is I had ideas, I had a lot of ideas, and I also was doing a lot of research. I also felt that Danny was a guy that maybe would talk to me while I was working on the book, and it, he did. He would go off in different directions. He would take me places I didn't necessarily think I was going to go. So my feeling when I'm writing is to let the characters go. Then I look at it in the cold light of day, a day later, two days later, what have I written? What's going on here? And then I either pull them back or I allow them to go off in that direction. The, the most stimulating thing for me is writing myself into a corner, putting myself someplace where, how am I gonna get him out of this? And then figuring out how to get him out and make it something that, that the audience, or not the audience, but the readers will find credible. That's amazing. And do you think that the unexpected Danny Green has potential to become a TV movie for both television or streaming? That is my hope. Yes. We're talking to people now and uh, hopefully something will come of that very, very soon. Um, I, I think that when I was writing it, I, I was really thinking in terms of the visual aspects of the book, the dramatic aspects of the book, there are boxing matches in the book, although it is not exclusively about boxing. It's really about relationships, family, integrity, and, and this young man's journey. But all the boxing matches 
have unique circumstances. Something happens within those matches that changes his life and changes the lives of the people that he is fighting. So, and everything that I put in there in those boxing matches are things that actually has happened to different fighters through the years. Amazing, amazing. So second last question, if you had the opportunity to meet with an individual who wants to, who is either a journalist or a PR person who wants to enter the media industry right now, what advice do you share with them? I would say several things. Believe in yourself. You're going to run into a lot of obstacles. You're going to run into a lot of naysayers. You're going to run into a lot of people who don't want you to succeed. You have to believe in yourself. Years ago, I was told several things. One of them was, this is a business, the entertainment business, like other businesses, about timing and who you know. Now, I didn't know hardly anyone, but you got to knock on doors, constantly, constantly, repeatedly knock on doors. And when you get in that door, because you will have an opportunity, maybe you'll get one in your life, maybe you'll get 10 in your life. When that door opens, it depends how well prepared you are and or how talented you are to take full advantage of it. I got to tell you, my training working for the news division was like going to the gym. Every day, it was like doing curls and exercising that muscle, which allowed me then to become a better writer. So now when I sit down to write, oftentimes I can work very quickly. I can write on demand. Just because I had to write on demand by, for deadline every day in the news division. But my advice to people is be persistent, maintain your integrity, and, and don't let anybody tell you you can't succeed. I really, truly believe we all have creativity in us. It's just about, about exploiting it, bringing it out, and seeking out people who are going to help us along the way. There are always going to be mentors. There's always going to be people who recognize something unique and special in you. It may not come every day, and they certainly aren't going to beat a path to your door. So you got to go out and find those people, and you have to go out and, and offer something to them. They're not going to just give you a job, but they are going to recognize in you. And if they see that you're capable, as they did with me in many cases, they'll give you the ball and say, go, kid, run with this ball, because it makes their life easier. <laughs> if, if you have somebody, if you have somebody say, hey, let me do that, let me do that, and then you do it, they go, great. They can kick their feet up and let you go work. So that's, that's what it takes. And I think I never went after the money per se. I never just said, I'm doing this for money. I did it because I wanted to do it. I wanted to succeed. And I felt I had something to offer. And I'll tell you, Jacob, the money comes. Awesome. If, if you do that, if you fulfill your destiny, and if you pursue your passion, people will, will then give you money. <laughs> uh, that's awesome. That's awesome. So Paul, where can my audience buy your work and also connect with you? Well, they can connect with me on Instagram, Paul R. Friedman. They can connect with me at prfriedman2001 at Gmail, and uh, they can find the book at amazon.com. The book is available at Amazon and it's Fortunately, getting some great notices. I'm, I'm very, very encouraged by, by the response I've gotten from men, from women, from families. People seem to really like the book. And if you're in the LA area, it's at Book Soup, and it's also at the Village Well in Culver City. Book Soup's on Sunset, the Village Well's in Culver City, and uh, soon we're going to be in New York bookstores as well. Congratulations on that, Paul. So guys, if you haven't listened to it, if you missed an episode of the Jake Stick with Jacob LHR podcast, head over to our pages on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, Spreaker, and Deezer. It's Jake's Take with Jacob LHR, J-A-C-O-B-E-L-Y-A-C-H-A-R. Are you, are, are you on social media? Because I'm on social media too. Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube. Jacob Alishar, J-A-C-O-B-E-L-Y-A-C-H-A-R. Paul, just to let you know, the blog that started all, jakes-shake.com, is celebrating 11 years this August. Congratulations. Man, you've been Thank working you. hard. You've been working hard, Jacob. <laughs> Thank you so much, Paul. So if you missed miss any, you can check out all my reviews, including the latest on America's Got Talent and The Masked Singer on jakes-shake.com and more interviews as well. 
Paul, thank you so much for taking time in your schedule to talk with me today. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Jacob. It's been really enjoyable. Thank you so much. And for yeah. those of you listening, who took time on your schedules listening, have a fantastic day, and I will see you next time. Goodbye.